Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. This week's guest is a familiar face on our screens, probably best known for presenting on the BBC's Stargazing Live, which encouraged more than four million viewers to get out and enjoy the night sky. A few years ago, astronomer and science broadcaster Mark Thompson joined me on an expedition to the Arctic Circle to raise funds and awareness for Bernardo's, Britain's leading children's charity. The trip in the depths of winter ignited his passion for the extraordinary work the charity does. Not only is Mark now a fellow Bernardo's ambassador, he's preparing for a Guinness World Record attempt a 140-hour live lecture for them. Yes, that is 140 hours. Mark, you crazy, crazy man. I want to hear all about this marathon lecture and uh, how it came about. When you say it like that, Helen, it sounds like such a big number. I think in my head, it's felt smaller ever since I constructed the idea. So uh, about seven or eight years ago, I gave a 24-hour lecture at the Royal Institution in London And at the time, I wondered what the world record was. So I looked into it and found out that it was 139 hours, 42 minutes and 56 seconds. Some professor in India lectured about, uh, I think it was computational science. How on earth you talk about that for nearly, well, best part of five and a half days? I've got no idea. But anyway, at the time, I thought, not a chance, not interested. That's just insane. Why would anyone do that? So I just stuck my 24 hours, happy with that. I got on with my life, but ever since, it's just been niggling away in the back of my mind and talking to colleagues at the Norwich Science Festival, who I'm a a patron for, basically they talked me into it. Uh, This was a few years ago now, but they've talked me into it. And and ever since then, we've been preparing and working up to uh, the event, which starts in about 13 days' time. I remember your 24-hour marathon because I was your glamorous assistant for a little tiny bit of it. I was. I put some laboratory perspex glasses on and helped you with a few experiments. You'd forgotten you almost, that, hadn't you? You almost looked intelligent at that point, Helen, when you wore the, when you wore that sign. That was very harsh. <laughs> but you did. You came along. It was good fun, wasn't it? I think I made you create some sort of foamy explosion, didn't I? Or something. I can't remember which experiment <laughs> it was. We did do a foamy explosion. I think from memory, I think it was purple. And I think I'm going to try and dig out those pictures. But the only reason I mentioned being your glamorous assistant in my little white coat is that I remember at the time, 24 hours seeming an awful long time and Mm. wondering how on earth you're going to keep going and awake. So how Mm. on earth are you going to keep going for 140 hours? And and what happens with sleep is a tiny bit allowed. Yeah. So what? what the the rules of the record allow me to have a five minute break every hour or I can have I can batch them up and I can have a longer break a little bit later on. So the plan, and I've had lots of conversations with sleep scientists, with nutritionists and vocal coaches and medics as well, of course, doctors in in the world of both psychology as well as medical uh, or physical medicine. And what we've decided, the best approach is to talk for two hours, have a five minute break. Talking for two hours is not a problem for me at all. Talk for two hours, uh, have a five minute break, talk for another two hours and keep going doing a two hour talk and then five minute breaks. And after about 40 hours or so, I build up enough banked break time to be able to have something like a 90 minute gap so I can then try and get some sleep. So across the whole event, I'll have the opportunity. It's not so I will manage to sleep, but I'll have the opportunity to get about four and a half hours sleep across those five and a half days. That is still an incredible attempt. It's yeah. insane. And I know that you're already wearing a device with 13 days to go to monitor your sleep and activity. Just tell us a bit about the science that's going on behind this in terms of your body and your sleep needs. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's a, it occurred to me it was a great opportunity, you know, being someone who's always been passionate and excited about science ever since I was a young lad, only a few years ago, of course. I realised and recognised it was a great opportunity. Why are you laughing? Uh, Recognised it was a great opportunity for science to maybe get a little bit of good out of what I was attempting to do. So I've contacted, well, I I made contact initially with with a a scientist over at Cambridge University, Christian uh, Beckenstein, and he works in the sort of cognitive studies. So the sort of study of how we uh, connect with the world around us. And he worked with me on, on, on one research project, but I've since been contacted by a scientist from the Oxford University, and also from the University of Uppsala in Sweden. To cut a very long story short, there's never been a study where someone will has been as sleep deprived as I will be that's actually been studied by science. Now, because it's such a, an extreme level of sleep deprivation, ethically, 
No scientific study is allowed to ask someone to be sleep deprived for such a long period of time. But because I'm doing it and I'm offering myself up as a guinea pig, then it's a great opportunity for science to study extreme sleep deprivation. This has never been done before. So what they're looking at is a number of different studies. The watch that you refer to me wearing it's not actually a watch i'll hold up to the camera but of course it's not going to help the, the listeners it's um, not very helpful you can on a think. podcast <laughs> it, it looks you can like describe a watch. it it looks okay, like a watch it, yes it, it does just look like a watch but the problem is that it's not a watch so i've lost count of how many times i've looked at it to see what the time is very frustrating but what it's doing is it's tracking with incredible accuracy my activities it's a bit like your you know your smart watch that people have got, so many people have got smartwatches these days, but it's a very, very accurate activity tracker. And what they're doing is they're starting to get a baseline of my sleep habits. So what we'll be able to do is look at how my sleep habit is normally during normal night sleep, uh, see what my activity levels are like. Uh, that will inform them what my circadian rhythm is like. That's the the sort of the natural daily peak and trough of, of our body clocks. And then they'll study my circadian rhythm during the attempt and afterwards as well as I recover. So it's not just the watch that I'll be wearing. I'll be wearing an EEG machine, which will pick up my brainwave. So I've got this funky sort of headband that I'll be wearing during the entire attempt. I'll be swallowing some ingestible thermometer pills, which were developed by wow. NASA. Uh, and they're, thankfully, they're one use only. They've not got to be recovered. If they were, then I'd get someone to recover them for me. But they're going to send... Uh, your the, glamorous uh, assistant would be doing that. Assistant. There's a job for you, Helen, so that you can come and Thank help me out Thank you very much. Thank God they're and one what, use only. For, fortunately, they send the signal wirelessly out to a receiver and that will, uh, again, tell the scientists what my circadian rhythm is like. And there's a whole host of things. We're taking pictures of my face every two hours. Apparently, you become less attractive as you get more and more sleep deprived. So they're going to be taking photographs of my face to see how my physiology changes throughout the whole thing. And this has got real world impact because we all know that sometimes you can look at a friend and say, Crikey, you look really tired. But it's about being able to objectively measure that. And what the uh, the, the crew at, at uh, Cambridge are particularly interested in is seeing if they can develop an algorithm that will enable us to apply it to someone's face to say, you're too tired, you shouldn't be driving a car, for example. So smartphones have got the ability to use face recognition and ultimately could lead to technology that will be able to inform whether someone's too tired to be driving a car or not. So it's got real world implications. So I'm really excited about it. That is really exciting and it's absolutely right up your street. What are the downsides for you physically and mentally of sleep deprivation and how prepared are you to realise that your body is going to need some time, I'm guessing, to recover from this. It's a funny thing because you can't really prepare for sleep deprivation. All you can, I mean, we, we talk about sleep credit and sleep debt, and that's the thing. It's, it's not something where if you miss an entire night's sleep, for example, you can then sleep for seven hours the next day and, and recover all that sleep. It doesn't work like that. You can recover about 60, 70% of the sleep that you lose but not all of it. So throughout our lives, so many interesting aspects to sleep. And if if you think about, you know, most people probably sleep for maybe six or seven hours a night, if we're all really honest. According to the World Health Organization, adults should have between seven and nine hours sleep. So the average person loses out on an hour's sleep every night of their lives. And of course, if you add that up, then that's a massive amount of sleep that people are losing. But for my attempt, I can't build up a, you know, a load of sleep credit because it just doesn't work like that. So all I can do is I can get enough sleep to make sure I'm as completely rested as possible, maybe bank a few hours of sleep. So on the week leading up to it, I'll be getting 10 hours sleep or trying to get 10 hours sleep a night, which will give me as much of a chance as I can to get a little bit ahead of the game. But ultimately, it's just a case of get on with it and see how you fare. Now, what I did do last year was I, I stayed awake for 60 hours to see if I had the ability or I guess the tendency to be able to cope with sleep deprivation. And after those 60 hours, I actually gave a one hour lecture and actually it went really well. So signs are good that I'll be okay and I will be able to cope with it. But as I get sort of three, four days into it, I could, could start hallucinating. I could start talking utter gibberish. Some might say, how would you know? Uh, the people who know me, <laughs> I mean, you spent nights with I me didn't in the Arctic. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You were going to say it though, Helen. You were going to say it. I can see it in your eyes. Yeah, so I could be start talking utter nonsense, but I've got a team of people who are going to be supporting and, and monitoring me. And actually the decision to pull the event, if I'm starting to show signs of talking nonsense for 30 seconds or so, that decision will not be with me. That will be with other people because it's a bit like being drunk. 
when you're sleep deprived, you've got no idea that you're sleep deprived. So the decision to pull the event will actually be in other people's hands and not mine. It's a fantastic challenge. I'm really impressed you're going to be doing it. What content are you going to present? You have a world of content to choose from. So what are you thinking? Well, obviously my subject is space because that's my passion. Apart from sleep, and I've become so fascinated with sleep over the last year or so, but space is my real passion. And normally I'm used to giving lectures that might last an hour, hour and a half. And the difficulty is is what to leave out a one hour lecture about the moon, for example. But I've now got 140 hours to play with. So I'm, I'm just trying to capture everything I can think about that relates to space. So I'll be covering the, the solar system, the planets in the solar system, comets, stars, the evolution of stars, black holes, space travel, the search for extraterrestrials, space telescopes, light pollution, choosing telescopes, anything you can think about, I will try and cover it. Now, fortunately, according to the rules from Guinness, I am allowed to repeat content, but not within four hours. So the game plan, because I can normally finish a one hour lecture pretty well on the hour. But if you're trying to talk about 140 hours, I've got about 2000 slides. And frankly, I've got no idea how long that's actually going to last for. So consequently, my plan is to just go through that lot, which I hope will take about the five and a half days. But I can then just, if I finish early, I can just start from the beginning and start going through it all again. And can we dip in and support as members of the public? Can we watch some of these lectures? Yeah, absolutely. The one thing I've not wanted to do is, is publicise when I'll talk about certain topics, because, you know, as I get more and more tired, I'm going to perhaps speed up, perhaps slow down, lose my place. So it's going to be very much a lucky dip as to what topic you get when you dial in and watch it. But yes, it's all going to be streamed on my YouTube channel. So if people head over to my website, which is markthompsonastronomy.com forward slash GWR, then they'll get the link to the uh, YouTube channel and you can hook up there and watch it. For people who are in Norfolk or the East Anglian area, I would love them to come along and actually watch because, again, one of the rules of the record is that I must have one audience member at all times. And so if there's a period of time where there's no audience, game's up and that's the end of the attempt. So if people are in the area, it's at the University of East Anglia. Tickets are all on the website as well. They're free to come along and to watch. But yeah, if people can come along to the theatre and actually watch me go stark raving mad, then it'll be worth a watch, I'm sure. And that's through the night, presumably. You need at least one audience member. 24-7 from midday on the 11th of September all the way through until about 8 o'clock on Friday morning. Sounds a long while when you put it like that, doesn't it? It sounds an awful long while. I'm really proud that you're doing it, really. And, and I know that when we went to the Arctic Circle and we raised funds and awareness for Bernardo's on, on a, what was an extraordinary fun trip that we'll be talking about in a minute, what was it about the charity that really captured your imagination and that's inspired you to do this world record attempt in their name? I've spent a lot of my time working to try and encourage kids to get interested in science. And that's a very important thing for me is, is encouraging future generations to be interested in, in all manner of different science subjects. And so the fact that Bernardo's is a kid's charity, I've got two children, they're very healthy, very well. They've had, you know, I like to think they've had a great childhood. I had a wonderful childhood as well. And I think because of that, it resonated with me nicely. And it was a real, I don't know, it pulled on my heartstrings a little bit that it was trying to make kids' lives better. And that's a really important thing for me. And I think realising that I can make a difference and I can help was what captured my imagination. I remember the Northern Lights saluted us when we went over to Finland. We saw a hint of green in the sky. I'm going to see mm. if I can get this right. We saw a hint of Try auroral again. in the sky. Auroral. Auroral. We saw a hint of, I can't we, say it. You got it there. We saw a hint of aurora. So, yeah, aurora. But they're cool. I mean, people do talk about auroral activity, so, yeah, they talk about the aurora and we saw a hint of that, didn't we? And it was a really frustrating trip, really, because the moon was fairly full as well, which meant that if you get a full moon, then that means you can't see a lot of other fainter things in the sky. So it would have rendered the fainter aurora displays less visible but we saw a little bit of it didn't we and it was like it was a great wonderful experience it was a wonderful experience and i remember midnight forays in our pajamas with you being all <laughs> excited to see if we could find a break in the cloud and actually yeah. we didn't really but we also did some experiments out there because we made a film and i remember you making me hold in the snow 
a saucepan of boiling water yes and you gave me the confidence to throw it over my head to see what happened to it and i must have trusted you mark because i I did it and we filmed it on our phones tell us what happened yeah so just to sort of clarify just in case people think that sounds like a great idea i'll try that what what we did helen didn't stand there and just dump hot water on her head that wasn't pouring it on her head it was sort of throwing it almost over your shoulder, wasn't it? Making a great big arc of water, almost like you're throwing it behind yourself. But boiling hot water is actually closer to freezing than general normal cold water. And what happened is, is you sort of launch uh, hot boiling water into the Arctic air is that the water instantly vaporizes and you get this wonderful sort of steam, arcing steam effect over your head. And it looked absolutely tremendous. And I've never had the opportunity to do that before. I've been to a trip to the Greenland, but I didn't have the opportunity to do that randomly. And of course, here in the UK, we never get that cold, do we? So it was a brilliant opportunity to do a little bit of real science there while we're there. It was really good fun. And I would just recommend do not try that at home. We were in the perfect conditions. I, as you know, Mark, am fascinated by stars, planets, our solar system, the Milky Way. And I hang on to every word when, you know, I've been lucky enough to be in your presence on a a trip like that. But I don't really remember ever asking you where your passion for the night sky and everything that's out there really came from in the first place. My dad, I think, had the interest when I was younger. So I was about 10 years old, only about 15 years ago or so. And I (laughs) was taken to the, uh, the Norwich Astronomical Society by my father. I think he'd got the interest. I don't remember having an interest in in the night sky before then. We saw Saturn through a telescope. Do you know what? It was the most incredible view. And I can still visualise now Saturn again with the rings against the the sort of the inky, velvety blackness of space. And to see that with your own eyes, it was just incredible. I don't even think I've seen a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope that's beaten seeing it with your own eyes for the first time. And that moment that single moment is what really captivated me about the night sky and ever since i've just been wanting to share that with people but funnily enough my dad that was enough for him and he kind of had enough and carried on enjoying football and you know and other things that he enjoyed but he never really followed an interest in astronomy after that he just wanted to have a look and he saw it and he was happy but what he did do and this is something that again you know i like to take this forward into my life is every friday night he would take me along to my local observatory when I was a child, you know, 10, 11, 12 growing up and sat in the car listening to Radio 5 Sport while I went in and talked to other people who were interested in the night sky. And it's so important for parents to encourage kids and to support them in anything they want. You know, that's what I hope to do with my kids. And I think, again, that's why I love Bernardo's because it helps kids have not had the best start in lives. And did you then end up getting a telescope that you could use at home? I did, yes. Do you know what? My my parents bought me this NAF telescope. I'm, I didn't know at the time. It was wonderful. But it was a telescope that I think it came from a second-hand shop and it cost like 10 or 15 quid or something. It wasn't the best of qualities. And, and I actually remember looking through it. And with the telescope, no matter what stars you're looking at, there are always pinpoints of light. You can't magnify a star enough to turn it into a disc because they're so far away. And I remember looking through this cheap telescope that they bought me, and I remember twiddling the knob, which turned out to be something called a focusing knob, which is what you use to make stars pinpoints. And I remember thinking, as you turn it, the star gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what I did not realise is that they're getting less and less in focus. So it's getting worse and worse quality. But I thought I could see the surface of a star, even though it was a rubbish image. But now I know. At the time, it's like, oh my God, this is incredible. And, you know, I think that's so important. If kids are interested in astronomy, get them a cheap telescope. You'll hear a lot of other astronomers say, buy binoculars to start with. Then if you like it, get into telescopes. For kids, get them a telescope. No matter how cheap it is, just get them a telescope and spark their imagination. So, yeah, I did get a telescope. I tried making telescopes over the years to various different degrees of success. But now, of course, I've got a computerized one that I can fire it all up from home uh, and don't even need to leave the house, which is... uh, A little bit more decadent, perhaps, but it saves me getting outside getting cold. Well, things have definitely changed as well. As We've got an app for the kids that we sometimes stand on our Mm. balcony and we use the app where you can see the constellations, which is quite a good, fun thing to do. But how did that boyhood passion turn into a career? Well, I I spent a lot of time uh, as I was growing up, started getting involved in the Astronomy Society. I started giving lectures at the Astronomy Society when I was kind of in my probably late teens, I think I started giving lectures of various different qualities. Uh, And I remember my first ever lecture, I can remember it so vividly. I remember using an overhead projector 
And I can remember feeling this bead of sweat dripping down the side of my head when I stood in this room. There's about 12 people there. But I remember this bead of sweat dripping down the side of my head. I was nervous as heck. But doing a lot of work for the local astronomy society and, and doing lectures and doing public events. And I started getting involved with local BBC and local newspapers. And if they want to talk about a space story, they come to me and I talk to them about it. And I think the culture show came down to Norfolk or came up to Norfolk from London quite some years ago now. And they asked me if, because I was did a lot of work for local media, I was contacted and I showed a group of uh, inner city kids around telescopes and observatory and, and showed them the night sky. And I was seen off that by a producer of The One Show. And off the back of doing a few short videos for The One Show for a few years now, I ended up getting the uh, the slot on Stargazing Live. So it was very much a case of being in the right place at the right time, but also about looking out for the right opportunities and taking those opportunities. I mean, crikey, I did a lot of work for local media for free without any benefits at all. But I think it's really important, especially for youngsters, to look for opportunities and, and take opportunities and keep, keep as many doors open as you can. And, you know, and then opportunities hopefully will present themselves to you. And did you have a scientific background at school as well? Because, you know, you, you're a scientific expert as well as an astronomer. Was that uh, more sure. from your education, if you like? Do you know what? It wasn't. I am your classic amateur astronomer. And amateur is a word which uh, I think in French means for the love of. And a lot of the historically very well-known astronomers were actually, they actually had jobs doing other things. There's a lot of the sort of the classical Victorian astronomers they actually had jobs. They were vicars. A lot of them were brewers, which I don't know if there's any particular correlation between astronomy and drinking alcohol, but it seems to be. But a lot of them who made all the really big discoveries were actually amateur astronomers. So my background is one of just being a very enthusiastic lover of science. And I've taught myself, learned things myself. I've gone out there. And I think if you're passionate about a subject, learning about it is not difficult. A couple of years ago, I was given an honorary doctorate by my local university. So it does show that you don't have to go through the classical routes to achieve your dream. Sometimes the less obvious routes are the, are the ones that work. Does that mean I should have been calling you Dr. Thompson? Should have been, yeah. But I'll let you off. I'll let you, you let off this off. one. <laughs> good, good, good. What I'd like to know is I'd like to get a bit geeky go for it. and just know what are the most interesting stars and planets out there. Well, there's a star which is – so we'll start off with Neptune. Neptune is a planet where the atmosphere, it's got, a, so planets in the solar system, we've got the four inner rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are much larger, but they're made, mostly made of gas. Uranus and Neptune are often called ice planets, but to all intents, they're big balls of gas. Now, the, the atmospheric pressure on Neptune is so intense that the carbon in the gas of Neptune we believe has turned into a, an ocean of diamond. So liquid really? diamond under the sort of the visible cloud belts of Neptune. And there's possible that there could be diamond icebergs floating around in the diamond lakes on Neptune. How wonderful does that sound? Gosh, that sounds absolutely amazing. Doesn't what it? else? And Can very, very us? expensive, I imagine. Yes. Um, there's other wonderful words. There's a moon uh, of Jupiter called Enceladus. Oh, is that Jupiter? Yeah, sorry, uh, Saturn. Sorry, moon of Saturn called Enceladus. There's one around Jupiter called Europa. And a number of these moons, Europa in particular, have, we believe, got subsurface oceans. Now, we know they're made of ice. And uh, Europa in particular has orbits around Jupiter, which is a massive planet. So it gets gravitationally squeezed and squashed. Now, the Earth get squeezed and squashed because of the effects of tidal forces. But Europa, which is the moon of Jupiter, gets squeezed and squashed. So we think the ice inside has actually melted. So we're fairly sure that there's an ocean underground on Europa. Now, if you look at the oceans underground, uh, sorry, the depths of the oceans on the Earth, for example, the Marianas Trench right down the bottom, there's no sunlight being received at all. And of course, if there's no sunlight, then you'd think there's no life because life on Earth relies upon sunlight at the very base of the food chain. But at the bottom of the ocean, there is no sunlight. However, we still find that there's life at the bottom of the oceans, And it's based off thermal vents, which are pouring out energy, pouring out uh, lots of nutrients into the ocean. And it's that which is causing this life to proliferate around these vents. But of course, if there's life at the bottom of the oceans when there's no sunlight, there's a very good chance we could find life at the bottom of the oceans on Europa as well. And that would be the most amazing discovery. 
And this is all done on science, isn't it, Mark? I mean, doesn't it frustrate you that you just can't get out there and have a look? Yeah, it does, you know, but we, we've learned so much. The only places we've, we've been to the moon, of course, uh, 12 people have been to the moon, walked on the surface of the moon. We've sent spacecraft now to every planet in the solar system, even Pluto, which isn't classed as a planet anymore. But everything else we've learned about is through using telescopes. I still to this day find it amazing that we know so much about the universe just by sitting here and looking and using our ingenuity. For example, uh, Eratosthenes back in 2 BC, which is a lot of years ago, he calculated the circumference of the Earth. And he did that fairly accurately just by looking at shadows at different places on the Earth and work out the fairly basic mathematics to work out how big the Earth was. And that level of ingenuity shines throughout all of history where people use observations, come up with some incredible theories and then test those observations. And, you know, they turn out to be right, which proves at that point, at least, and ironically, science is all about disproving things. So we're constantly trying to disprove the current theories that we have about stellar evolution, the life cycle of the sun, where the earth came from. But it's all about observation. But yeah, oh my crikey, wouldn't it be wonderful to go to some of these places like the Diamond Oceans on Neptune? It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? It sounds wonderful. I hope you'll take me along and we'll do a podcast when we go there. Uh, <laughs> your research is centred chiefly on... What's your budget on... like? <laughs> <laughs> your research is centred chiefly on deep space and distant galaxies. Expound. I think one of my real fascinations is about the things at the very edges of the universe. Now, one of the beauties of studying the universe and the night sky is that the further away you look, the further back in time you're looking. Now, light travels about 300,000 kilometers every second. So it's not instant. When you turn your light switch on in your house, you think the light comes on instantly, but it doesn't come on instantly. It does take fractions of a second for the light from the bulb to reach your eye. Now, of course, if you increase the distance between the light bulb and your eye, it takes a bit longer. Now, the light from the moon takes just over a second to get to us. So if the moon vanished, then we wouldn't know about it for a second because that light would still be traveling to us. The sun is just over eight light minutes away. So it takes just over eight minutes for the light from the sun to get to us. But if we look at the most distant galaxies in the universe, then we're looking at things that are so far away that it takes light billions of years to get here. So there's galaxies that we can look at in the night sky whose light I could capture on a camera tonight, but that light has been travelling longer than the Earth has been here. And that is just such a mind-blowing fact. And of course, the further away you look, the longer it's taken the light to get here, which means we can look back in time. And we can actually get and build up a really fairly accurate picture of the way the universe has evolved just by looking at distant objects. That's fascinating. Now, you mentioned that you use a telescope on your computer. Are you looking at a screen and you're not outside? Tell me more. I, I, I'm quite puzzled by that. Yeah, well, do you know what? Think Things have, have moved on a lot. And when I started doing astronomy, and if, if you want to take a picture through a telescope, you'd have to put a camera on the back of the telescope with a film and you'd have to stand there and you'd have to control the telescope for the length of the exposure. Now, when you take pictures uh, through telescopes, typically the exposure, so the length of time you're letting that film try and capture your picture can be anything from a few minutes to maybe even half an hour to even longer than that. And for all that period of time, the telescope has got to accurately point at the thing you're trying to photograph. Now, the Earth spins, as you know, once every 24 hours, the Earth spins on its axis. And that means that the stars move slowly across the sky. So a telescope has to have a drive system that moves in the same speed, but in the opposite direction to the Earth's rotation. So it keeps the object in the centre of, of the film. Originally, when I started doing astronomy, it was a case of cameras and film, and you stand there controlling the telescope. But nowadays, of course, with computers, with modern DSLR type cameras. Now we use cameras that are like a DSLR. They've got a, a CMOS chip inside it, an electronic chip rather than the film. And all of that, of course, can plug into a computer. So the telescope drive systems can plug into a computer. The cameras can plug into computers. And actually, you know, most professional observatories, all professional observatories are all computerized these days. And actually, all, most of the astronomers don't even sit in the same country as the telescopes, they operate them from home. They say, I want to have a picture of this object at this time of night. And the uh, the camera and the telescope will fire into action and it takes the picture. For amateur astronomers, certainly there's still a huge number who still like to get outside and look at the stars. And I do as well. I do still love 
getting outside and looking at the stars. But if it comes down to taking pictures, I'd rather just sit at home, put a glass of wine on the table next to me and, uh, and <laughs> fire the computer up. And does the night sky offer something different every time you look at it? Do you know it does? There's so many different objects out there. I mean, for one thing, of course, throughout a year, we have different objects to look at. So in January, you'll see a different sky to the one you see in August. And the one you see in August will be a different one to the one you see in November. Of course, you throw in the fact that at nighttime, things move. So if you look at the sky just after sunset, it will be different to the sky just before dawn. So the sky is always changing. The planets themselves, what you can see on the planets changes. All the pl- well, Most of the planets have got atmospheric effects that change. And we can observe those and we can study them and learn a little bit about how those planets are evolving. Things are always changing. Stars explode. You know, we we don't tend to think that stars like the sun will die, but the sun will die in about five billion years time and other stars do die. And we can study those stars as they explode in the sky. We can detect supernovae, which are stars exploding at the end of their lives. So there's always something going on and there's always something new to learn. I love stars and I love constellations and I like going to places where there's no pollution and it's that Mm. velvety, inky sky that you talked about and you see, I'm thinking, for example, of a trip I went to in the Atlas Mountains and Mm. the sky was black and there was no pollution and the stars looked spectacular. And you have got your own podcast, The Pocket Astronomer, and it's a bit of an audio guide to the stars, isn't it? And stories behind those constellations. Yeah, it is. You know, it's something that came off the back of of the COVID experience because one of the things that, you know, I tried to do, you know, my theatre show, Spectacular Science, wasn't touring during the lockdown period. So I was trying to find ways that I could help other people engage their kids because, you know, like many parents, the homeschooling was going on and kids were getting bored. They couldn't really go anywhere because there's nowhere to go and do anything. So I, I came up with this idea of trying to get families outside at night stargazing with me. And I was doing this thing called Family Stargaze with Mark over social media. And I got people outside looking at the stars and I was guiding them around the sky and I thought wouldn't it be wonderful if I could actually go out to people and talk to them about what you can see around the sky and that's when I came up with this idea of the pocket astronomer which was almost like having me in your pocket so I would tell people how to move around the sky what things you could look for what they actually are when you get to see them and just try and give people a bit of an experience about the things that you can see. So it was aimed at families, it was aimed at beginners, just to try and convert a few more people into getting out there and looking at the sky. We were going to do one together, I think, at Christmas, but you were poorly, which is such a great shame because I was so looking forward to sitting on my balcony and hearing the Christmas story. There are some great stories behind the constellations. Which ones, will you give us a couple, Mark, you know, a couple of your favourites? constellations they're funny things because there's eight there's 88 official constellations and they're defined by the international astronomical union and a lot of the constellations don't look anything like the things that they're supposed to look like there's one or two that do for example leo which is supposed to represent a lion and that actually looks a little bit like a lion but cancer is supposed to look like a crab and i looked at it for nigh on 30 years and i can't see a crab in there no matter how many times i look at it i think probably the area of sky that i particularly enjoy looking at rich with objects to study is the Orion area of the sky. And actually Orion in mythology was a hunter and you can actually see Orion in the sky. You can see the belt and you can see the sword which is hanging down from the belt. And actually the sword of Orion is home to one of the most wonderful things to look at, even in just in binoculars. And it's the Orion Nebula, which is a great big cloud of gas and dust where stars are forming. And I think that's a very special part of the sky, I think, because you've got a great mythology around this hunter and he's got his club or sword raised up above his head and he's got a shield in the other hand and he's trying to defend himself or fight Taurus the bull and you can see Taurus just next to him in the sky as well so I think that's a lovely sort of story and it it really you can see these great big creatures up in the sky and I don't know it it feels really quite magical. Oh you sort of making me eight sit outside with you and get you to talk me through it because it is wonderful having your expertise when we do that kind of thing. You genuinely have a gift and I really mean this Mark for explaining things in a really simple and clear way which is always a winner with me but it's (laughs) it's a gift that you use very well you've mentioned their books and kids and theatre shows and you've done a lot in that space to engage children get them into science into stem subjects we've brought our children to your live theatre show and you've been there's been things bubbling and all sorts of things happening I don't know whether you see it as a gift mark or is it just who you are you've just explained it all so well thank you for saying that's a lovely thing to hear and I think it's something that I just love doing 
I, I don't see it as a gift at all. I just love seeing kids get excited about science. And I love seeing adults see their kids get excited about something. And there's, you know, there's nothing more wonderful in this world. And we've had a funny old world over the last few years, haven't we? And there's nothing more wonderful than seeing young kids get excited about something and be it the stars. And I've, I've shown so many kids Saturn through a telescope like I've seen. And to see, you know, sometimes you can see the sort of reflection in their eyeball as they look through a telescope and to hear them kind of gasp and smile about seeing a planet for the first time. It's just like, it's the most wonderful thing. And I feel very lucky to be able to give that to other people. I bet you've missed your theatre show as well, because the other thing that you do in the theatre show is, you know, it's full of experiments. You make science fun, you bring it to life. And chemistry was always really good fun for me as a child, because in those days, back in 1901, you were actually allowed to have a chemistry set in your garage. <laughs> I, you know, I remember really? ordering all sorts of iron filings mm. and my Bunsen burner, and it's a wonder I didn't blow anything up at home. But that's, I think, how you capture children's imagination is that you you bring it to life. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the most important thing, there's there's lots of, of really quite wonderful science things, you know, be it chemistry experiments or be it things you can see in the sky. I mean, I could, I could take you out there tonight and I could show you an image of a galaxy which is so far away that it's, like I said, it's light left before the Earth was here. But it sounds fascinating, but if you look at it, it's just a faint grey smudge in the sky. And it doesn't look really that exciting, but it is. But I think especially for kids, it's got to be visual. And so I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a really important thing about picking the right things to show kids uh, and recognise that, you know, some things that might be interesting to you and I as adults, they're not going to be interesting to kids. And I, I actually use my mum as a as sort of a marker um, and I'm hoping she's not listening to this because she's like a big kid. And I think if my mum would enjoy this, if my mum would get enthused by this, then it's probably about the right level for the kids. I loved Stargazing Live on the BBC. How did that come about for you? Well, that came off the back of the one show, actually. So I, I got seen by one of the producers. I got contacted by uh, the series director of Stargazing Live after second sort of season of doing VTs for the one show. And they wanted someone, they, you know, they, obviously they got uh, Brian Cox in there as, as a uh, particle physicist. They'd got Dara Brian as a, and he's a very knowledgeable theoretical physicist. They'd also got Liz Bonin, of course. Oh, I don't know if she'd actually been engaged at that point, but they want someone who could actually show people the sky as well. And so, yeah, it was, it was wonderful to be a part of that. And I think what was really important for me, and I, I took away from this, is that with, and it was my first show that I'd actually presented live. I'd been on the one show live, but when you're being interviewed, it's a very different experience. But to present a show live, it was a very, very different world. And I think it, it made me realise a TV show is is a great example of how industry should work, where you've got a very immovable target, i.e. the show has got to go out at seven o'clock on Saturday night, whatever it is. But every single member of the crew, they know what their role is. And everyone else can rely upon everyone else. No one's got any hidden agendas. It works like clockwork because everyone knows what the common goal is. And, you know, I think that was a really powerful lesson that I learned about that. And, I, you know, I can apply that to all different places in my life nowadays. And presenting live, there's nothing quite like it. It must have been a very exciting feeling for you to take viewers on that live journey. Oh, God, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember the first time I had someone actually talking to me in my ear when I was trying to talk as well. That was the most off-putting experience, but soon get used to it. But I did have that wonderful experience. I don't know if if you, if you saw the show, I think it was the first series on the second night. I think Brian had just thrown across to me. I stood outside in this black field. You couldn't see anything where I stood. I looked up at the sky where I stood and I could see cloud. I could see nothing else visible. And just as I'd said, you know, I'd finished off, done my bit, finished off, said it's, it's cloudy here, there's nothing to see. And I then threw back to Dara and Brian in, uh, Brian in the studio. And just as I said, it's cloudy, there's nothing to see. Over my left shoulder, I think it was, there was a clear patch of sky and through that clear patch of sky, just as I said, you can't see anything. There was a meteor shot past that gap in the clouds. And apparently the film crew were trying to wave at me to tell me that there's just seen something, but I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And the whole sort of switchboard lit up because people were phoning in and tweeting, posting on social media saying, oh, the, the shooting star, the shooting star. I, was like, oh, I couldn't see it. I was looking the other direction. But it even made the news in America. One newspaper in particular, I shan't mention which one it was, made some reference to BBC Astronomer's Gaff. It's like, <laughs> do you know what? I was looking in that direction 
It was behind me. But you know what? You've worked in this industry. You can't lose sleep over those sort of comments. You certainly can't. And also you got the second series, more than 4 million people tuned in and started looking at what's just such a gift mark. It's there, isn't it? It's there for the taking. I mean, especially during lockdown, I think what a wonderful thing to encourage children and adults to do. It's there. That's the wonderful thing. It's a great route for children to get into science. But more than that, it's out there. No one's got to do anything to go and enjoy it. You don't have to buy anything. Telescopes help you a little bit. Of course they do, but you don't have to have them. You can go outside and you can see, you can see a galaxy. If you know where to look, you can see star clusters. You can see planets in the sky. There's so much that you can see. And you, all you've got to do is literally walk out your back door. And if you're in the middle of a city, just head out into the countryside for you know a couple of hours and, and you can see a wonderful dark sky. And it is the most amazing and I think humbling experience. I mean, we talked... Uh, about the evolution of stars earlier and there's one wonderful fact that was always shared by uh, you know myself and uh, astronomers like me that every element in your body has been created inside a star now when the universe formed about 14 billion years ago the only elements in the universe were mostly hydrogen and a bit of helium now our bodies are made up of carbon of iron of oxygen silicon calcium all those different elements that were never there when the universe formed and the place that those elements have been created is in the core of a star so every single atom in your body has been produced in the core of a star and that's a very humbling thing for me and I, when i look up at the sky that's the thought that always pops back into my head uh, of course what you could say helen is that you are either made of stardust which i think is a beautiful thing or you could say you're made of nuclear degenerate matter I'll let you pick which one you choose. I think I'm nuclear degenerate matter. That's how I'm feeling this evening. I'm not going to pass any judgment at all. Yes, that was a bit of a trick, wasn't it, to end on? What a wonderful fact to end on. We could just keep talking forever. I love all these facts. And soon, let's meet up and at night time and let's have a journey around the sky if you're up for that. I'll provide that the wine. That would be wonderful. That, that sounds great. wonderful. And listen, good luck with the marathon. I'll come and join you. I'll sit in for a few hours and try and keep you awake. But will you let us know how you get on? I hope it goes really well for yes. you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. You are very welcome. You have been listening to science expert and astronomer Mark Thompson, who'll be starting off his world record breaking 140 hour lecture attempt in 13 days time. So if you want to join him for a few hours, do because believe me, he's fascinating on his lectures and help keep his spirits up, help him stay awake. Who knows? Maybe you should take him a coffee. You can find out more and check it all out at markthompsonastronomy.com forward slash GWR. That's markthompsonastronomy.com forward slash GWR and also uh, check out Mark's podcast The Pocket Astronomer. Don't forget to download our podcast series too at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify Apple and Google Podcasts or just ask Alexa. I'll be back next week with the lovely Annika Rice hearing all about her latest challenge stand-up comedy and why a beautiful man called Roy is often to be found naked in her kitchen Intrigued? Join me then. Bye for now. <laughs>